So for interest of time, we're going to start, but there'll be people coming in. It doesn't matter. Feel free to come in and, and grab a chair. Um, so I wanted to thank, anyway, uh, to start by thanking the committee for the opportunity to do this, uh, this keynote. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to come to this conference. And I travel quite a bit. I, I attend a lot of conferences around the world on both accessibility and on teaching and learning. And this is one uh, that I always look forward to coming back. And there's three specific reasons why I enjoy it so much. Uh, and I ask you to, to reflect on this as well as we, as we go through the process. It's extremely creative in process. You have the, the, the discussion tables. Every year I come here and I see that they're trying something else and they're trying to really rethink the conference for, format. So I really applaud them for that and I think more conferences should be doing that. It's also very progressive. We go to so many of these accessibility uh, conferences where we look at the nitty gritty, we look at what we're doing wrong, but no one's ever looking forward, no one's looking at policy, we're not looking at management of change. And every time I come here, that's what people do. They're thinking of how can we change things, how can we move forward. So for that reason, it's, uh, it's, it's really great. The last point that I really enjoy is that it's really self-reflective. Um, all the presenters will have received the link to the video about how to integrate UDL into presentations. Um, every year we're reminded about having to reflect on what we do and trying to not just preach it, but actually do it. Uh, and it's something on which I'll come back in today. So I really applaud them for that as well, because in so many UDL conferences, um, you know, you attend and the content isn't even accessible. There's no UDL reflection going on while the conference is actually happening. This is not the case here at AHEAD, and every year we see that the focus is back on that. So it's really great to be here. Um, I really, really enjoy the fact that the keynote's been a little later in the day today. It's, uh, I enjoy it for, for, for many reasons, but the first one is that um, we've broken the ice already. You've attended a few, a few sessions. It's going to enable me to tie some themes that I've already seen and to tie them into uh, the topics that I, I, I want to, to raise today. So hopefully we can build on all these conversations, all that dialogue that's been happening, and we can move the conversation forward a little bit. The other reason why I really enjoy having this a little later is that I'm terribly jet-lagged. <laughs> Last year, I, last year, I lived on the east coast of Canada, so it was only a three-hour time difference. But this time, I'm coming from the west. I've moved out west. So it's a seven-hour time difference, and it's really, really painful. It's five o'clock in the morning now, so my brain is just coming into, into functioning. So bear with me for that. Um, and, and, to, and to add to this, I sat on a plane for nine hours with a, not a baby <laughs> next to me, but with a hyperactive teenager sitting right next to me. <laughs> So it made me think, because often in our line of work, we think about you know, a learner with ADHD, but well, this was a passenger with ADHD. And let me tell you that planes are not universally designed. I found that out for nine hours. <laughs> um, OK, so we'll make a start. People are still coming in. Um, I will try and make this as interactive as possible. As I said, I really like the fact that at the, uh, in your conference, every year we're encouraged to think about UDL as we present. There's always a bit of soul searching when you do a keynote because it's, it's inherently contradictory. How can I stand up here and talk to you in this format and try and make this UDL? So we're gonna try and experiment with this a little bit. You've also had sessions all morning already. Stomachs are grumbling. You're thinking, can you stop talking because we want lunch? So we'll try and liven it up and get you to talk to, to, actually to talk to each other as well. So it's not just me doing the talking. So I hope you're sitting next to someone you like, otherwise you still have time to move and change because you'll be doing a lot of talking to each other. Or hopefully find someone that you don't know and then you can network. Because that's the point of these conferences as well. We're here to create social capital, I'll come back to that. And it's the best way to do this. It's to actually you know, meet people and discuss the ideas that we, we're talking about with someone new and to create those connections. Right, so let's begin. I wanted to, um, to explain a little bit about myself and my background, and in the sense that it's relevant and pertinent to what I'm going to talk about today. So when I saw the, conference of the, uh, the title of the conference, right away I thought I want to put forward a, you know, a session on inclusion, a reflection on what inclusion is in higher education and how we construe that in higher education. Why? It's interesting. So I wanted to start by saying that um, as an academic, often people say, but what is your area of research? Because I've done lots of different things uh, in my life. I have, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I've worked in social and emotional behavior difficulties. Um, I was a teacher and a principal for about 15 years. 
I've also worked in indigenous education for a little while. I was involved in projects uh, in Quebec on indigenous education. I then worked while I was doing my PhD for four years as a manager of an accessibility service. And then, obviously now, I deliver courses to mostly in-service teachers through master's program. Um, and in that capacity, I've also uh, taught a lot of international students and got involved in inclusion with international students. So sometimes people say, well, what's the link between all of these things? Well, the link between all of these things is that each of these groups of learners has, um, in each of these cases, there was a disconnect between what we were providing and the expectations of the learner. Okay, so I'll let that sink in a little bit. When it comes to social emotional behavior difficulty particularly, um, if you're not familiar with that field and that body of literature, it's a field that's not diagnostic generally. It's actually about looking at, ecologically looking at behavior and saying maybe when we have behavior and disturbing behavior in a classroom, it's actually a, you know, a manifestation of a lack of fit between the way school is structured and the expectations of the learner. If you look at indigenous education, it's the same thing. We, you know, in Canada, we see terrible uh, sort of uh, observations of outcome, but really the system is broken. What we deliver and what the expectations of the communities are is completely broken. Inaccessibility, well, we know that, and we keep talking about the social model. So all of these theoretical models, they're actually fairly aligned, and they all talk about the disconnect between what learners want and what we provide. And the focus in each of these four domains that I've worked in is about bringing it back to designing in a different way. Designing in a way that's actually appropriate and relevant for the learner, right? And so there's a common thread be, 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 amongst all of these different experiences that I've had. So we're going to quickly look at the objectives of the session. So I'll let you read the slide. Uh, it talks about ex the complexity of the notion of inclusion. Uh, I'm just going to look at some of our theoretical assumptions. Uh, it's going to look at some of the theoret theoretical stances that we have. Now, don't get worried. We're going to unpack this. It's not going to get too wordy and too complicated, but it's important to look at, you know, what, where are we going? What are we trying to do? What are the intentions behind what we do with inclusion? And then we're also going to look at the multiple dimensions of inclusion uh, and, and try to see which ways can we look forward to in being collaborative and interdisciplinary in higher education uh, within, uh, with, within inclusion. Um, so I've done enough talking, I'm going to start giving you a little bit of time to, um, to interact with each other. So what I'd like you to do for about four minutes, let's say, because we do have only 15 minutes to do this, is to talk to your neighbor, talk in pairs, think pairs, in little groups, and try to explain exactly what is it that we mean when we, look, we talk about inclusion, right? I think we have to get into unpacking this right away. What does it look like? What's the format of inclusion? What is it trying to do? Right? It may seem like a general question, but as soon as you start talking, you may find that you actually are talking about very different things. So take a few minutes and please and discuss that, and we'll come back together as a large group. Okay, so far? Okay, so far? Oh, I like this. You see, they want to talk. <laughs>
cry this weekend. <laughs> Yeah, that's why they say so much on the microphone, if yeah, they, like, yeah. otherwise each other. Yeah. yeah, it's probably a lot easier for someone to be doing that remotely anyway, because yeah. then they can focus on what yeah. they hear. Really yeah. Yeah. I think they've had enough there. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring you back to the large group. Forget. So much energy. So this is a good lesson for all of you, of those of you who are teaching or supporting teachers. And Thinking about UDL, this is what you get when you attempt UDL, even when you're in a large lecture hall and you have a lot of people. Giving them a little bit of time to actually interact, action expression, or engagement, all of these things. You see it right away. It's really vibrant, all this energy in the room. Don't worry, we'll do three of these, so you'll get another chance. Stay with your pairs, stay with the group, we'll do this again. But just want to move it along because you do want to eat afterwards. Um, so you probably discuss lots of different things, right? And we, we start unpacking, we realize we mean very different things right away. Sometimes we mean put people together. Sometimes we mean uh, you know, give people different things but bring them to the same point, the notion of equity. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways, different ways that we interpret inclusion. So it's a very vague word and right away I think we need to really start unpacking it. So for the sake of conversation, I put up this slide, I'm just gonna describe it. If you work in K-12, you see this a lot. It's being used a lot to, dis to discuss inclusion in K-12. But I wanted to bring it up to see if we can use any of this to uh, start you know, really unpacking what we, what we have as notions. So uh, the first one, I'll describe it as a circle. Uh, in each, so there's four circles. The first one is inclusion. The other ones are not inclusion, but they have other names. Uh, and within that circle, you have the green dots, which are obviously the mainstream, the, the common denominator, the, 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 the regular sort of elements. And then you have dotted elements of different colors, which are obviously the marginalized, the students who, uh, or the elements that don't necessarily fit in. So in the first one, inclusion, you have the circle, and you have everyone in together, and everyone mixed within that circle. And it seems easy enough, right? That's probably what some of you brought up in your conversations. The next one is easy to exclusion. So in, in the other one, to describe it, inside a circle you only have the green dots and all the, the colored dots have been marginalized, they've been pushed to the outside. And we understand that too, that's segregation, that's exclusion. But what about the other two, right? Uh, you have segregation where you have, uh, this time we have two circles, one black with all the little green dots inside and then a smaller circle with all of the, the little um, you know, uh, other colored dots in it. So that's called segregation. But in K-12, for example, most of what we see still now when we talk about inclusion is segregation. It's this, special classes, remedial interaction, people actually being pulled out of class and being on the side. And yes, they are mixed. Yes, there's some social interaction. But they're not taking part in every single activity. They don't remain with their peers the whole time. They don't necessarily even always work on the same agenda or the same theme or the same activity. And sometimes they miss out things that are happening in a, in a classroom because they're being pulled out to do remedial action. Now, as I go through this, think about what we do in higher education. If we send students to an accessibility office to take exams, are we really doing inclusion? Or are we still doing this segregation? Right? There's a lot of this still happening. And then the last one is, uh, so there's still two circles, the large circle with the green dots. And then within that circle, you have another little circle with all the colored dots. Uh, and this one's called integration. That we see even more. And unfortunately, what we see in K-12 often when we talk about inclusion is really what we call integration, sometimes called mainstreaming as well, right? So people are physically in the same place, but they're not actually working on the same objectives, or they're not working on the same material, or they're working on different things. So here already we have a lot to unpack, right? In the format, in the word that we use, we use this word inclusion, but we need to unpack it. What does it mean? What does it actually represent? What format do we actually see? And in higher ed, it's even more complicated because really, because we've worked with a model of retrofitting, most of what we do is integration or segregation. It's not actually inclusion, all right? And this brings us back to UDL, because when we talk about UDL and the importance of UDL, UDL is the only model which actually enables you in higher education to get to the true picture of inclusion there, where everyone is constantly together, working on the same, on the same task, having that social interaction constantly. Okay, 
it's, n it's not even as easy as that. There's even other terms. So I've put a few up there. We talk about personalized learning, individualized learning, differentiation, UDL. I'd like to put you to the test to sit there and try and explain the difference between all of these, right? And yet we, we mix them up and we, you know, this is all inclusion somehow. So traditionally, I'll just run it quickly because theoretically when you look at the literature, traditionally you had personalized learning which was really by definition uh, when teaching was happening uh, in a mainstream way, but the objectives and the assessment was different for some students. So you're not actually working your students towards the same objectives, and you can alter the assessment format to the, uh, to the extent needed. So a student under personalized learning would not necessarily have been taking the same exams or getting the same credits as a student uh, in the same class. Now, that's completely changed now because a lot of people in higher ed uh, who work with technology are starting to say, well, using technology in the classroom really affords students personalized learning. So they've started talking about personalized learning within an inclusive format, personalized learning within differentiation, personalized learning within UDL. So it's got even more complicated now. Individualized learning used to be very simple. It was in K-12, it was students who had, uh, you know, what we call in North America an individual uh, a personalized ind or individualized uh, education plan or who in higher education have a specific set of accommodations. So they actually are working to the same objectives, they're working on the same content, working on the same assessment, but they are giving certain accommodations, they are giving certain affordances in doing things and achieving them in different ways. And then you have differentiation and UDL. So what's the difference between UDL and differentiation? So even as a specialist, sometimes I, I am counting conversations where people mix them up, they use them interchangeably. They really are quite different because when you look at, at differentiation, the literature on, different, on differentiation, Carol Tomlinson and people like that, it's really about walking into the classroom and then realizing that you have multiple needs within that classroom and immediately on the spot changing your way of delivering, right? So redoing a redesign on the spot to accommodate the different needs that you have in your classroom. Well, I see people talk about differentiation in higher education, and as faculty, I find it really, really difficult to engage with that, with that notion. Because really what you're asking instructors is to walk into a lecture hall, for example, and then change their teaching and adapt their teaching depending on the needs of the students in the classroom. A lot of them are going to say, I don't know what the needs of the students in my classroom are because they're grown up and they don't necessarily disclose and they don't actually share. A lot of them are going to say, I am so content focused, I don't have the time with 50 students or 100 students in the classroom to actually walk in and do that kind of juggling act, right? So UDL here is interesting because it's the only one really that, for higher ed purposes, tells us you can actually do this before you walk into a classroom. So we're then we're not asking instructors to actually do any juggling. We're not actually asking them to, to adapt and to think as they walk into a classroom. They can do all this at a design stage. All right? I'm not giving you all the answers. I'm just showing you for the moment how complex this notion is. So even when you talk with inclusion specialists and you talk about these four terms, they don't necessarily agree. People don't necessarily agree with uh, you know, the distinction between these different terms, how we apply them, what they mean. So we have, and the aim of this session is to show you how complex this notion is and how we have to unpack it and make sure we use the same discourse. I'm really encouraging you to go back when you are having discussions and to actually check that you're using the same terms for the same meaning. That's the best we can do because I don't think we can ever get to an agreement of what means what, but at least we can get to a level when we actually agree with the definitions that we are using those terms with. Um, I want to go a little further now, and we looked at the format. What is it? So now I'm going to give you another sort of four or five minutes to discuss with your peers. This time I want to say, where are we trying to go with inclusion? What is our intention? What are we trying to achieve in higher education with, our, with, with inclusion? Okay, so not just the way we're doing it, but what are we actually trying to achieve? Where are we trying to go? So go ahead, try and, and discuss that. And you should have even more divergence than you had before. <laughs>
Okay. Sorry to interrupt again. I'm going to try and bring everyone back to a large group again. So it's, fu it's fun to have the interaction, but I'm also... I'm wary of lunch being ready and you wanting lunch, so we have to continue. But this time, before we move on, I'd like to know, we've got a microphone. Does any of the group, any of the conversation, want to share some of the ideas that they had? There's probably a multitude of different intentions out there. Does anyone want to, just for fun? Come on, hands. Does anyone want to? No? OK, it's like in classrooms, right? Interaction, engagement, but they don't want you here. OK. Doesn't matter. We'll carry on. OK, I'll give you a hint at what you possibly could come across in any sort of form when you discuss this. There's pretty much six arguments that you will always find come back when we talk about inclusion. And here it gets more complicated because it means that really we're not even, not only do we disagree on the format, but we disagree on exactly what it is that we're trying to achieve. So I'm going to run through them quickly and then I'm going to go through them in detail and I'm going to ask you to reflect as to how each of these justification is suitable for higher education. All right, because we, we, we come across them on the whole spectrum from K-12 all the way uh, from elementary, secondary, all the way to post-secondary. It's a philosophical argument, the human rights lens, rights lens, the cognitive argument, social capital, pedagogical argument, and operational argument, right? So now I'm going to unpack this. And what I'm asking you to do each time while I'm talking is to think, is this something that we use as an intention, as a, a justification in higher ed? Is it suitable for higher ed? Or is it something I do as well? And is this how you would have defined your intentions? The point I'm going to mercilessly milk the whole Wizard of Oz thing, because I love the movie, is that really our experience is very different. We're on that same road, but we're very different people with very different intentions. So sometimes it looks like we're going in the same directions, but actually we're not actually going, we're not trying to achieve the same thing. Philosophical argument. It's one that we encounter quite a lot. Is this notion that really the classroom should be a microcosm for, the wide, for wider society. And therefore the classroom has a duty to prepare citizens for the diversity in the real world, all right? It's one that you see stated very, uh, you know, very strongly in the Salamanca, the Salamanca statement on inclusion. This notion that really we must have inclusive classroom because we must prepare our students for inclusive environment, for inclusive, uh, inclusive real life. Um, do we think, is that what, is that what justifies our, our work towards inclusion in higher ed? What do you think? It's tough to say, right? Because at the same time, higher education is, in most countries, selective, right? So we're often already saying, well, it's not like K-12. It's not like the elementary and secondary. We actually don't have to be that diverse. You actually hear some campus saying, we don't want to be that diverse. We actually, we are exclusive. We actually have already selected the ones that we want. We don't need to have the full spectrum of talents and profiles in our classrooms. So that's where it gets tough, because in higher ed, you will already see a disconnect there, you know, a dichotomy in dialogue as to, is that what we want to achieve, or is it not what we want to achieve? Um, I will, um, I'll try and shock you a little bit, but I was director of accessibility for four years, and I had a head of the department once write to me by email, do you think I give an F about inclusion? And it really shocked me to the core because I thought, how can he even write this, right? Thinking is one thing, but he actually writes it. But for a lot of people, it's not in higher ed because they always function in an environment actually that's selective, exclusive, and suddenly you're telling them you have to be diverse, you have to reflect diversity in society, and for a lot of them, they think, why, right? That's never been what it's about. The second one, human rights land. This one is very easy for anyone working in accessible to understand because it's pretty much what we've been doing, right? It's working against discrimination. So it's already very different from the first one. You're not necessarily trying to get everyone to the same place in the same way through equity. You're actually saying we are trying to avoid discrimination and whenever there's this, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, an element of discrimination, we're gonna try and rectify it with retrofitting, special measures, we're gonna compensate for the, discri the discrimination that's already happened. So this you see in the Canadian Charter of Rights, the ADA in the States, the Equality Act, that's the legislative foundation for most of the work that we do in higher education. So I'm, I'm giving the answer on this one. This we see a lot in higher education, it's what we do. But is that inclusion? 
because often what it is, it's actually rectifying discrimination after it's already occurred. It's rectifying a bad situation, right? That's not the ideal scenario. Is that really inclusion? Second one is the cognitive argument. So this we've seen a lot because since Gardner's uh, theory on multiple intelligences have been refined, redefined, and really you've, we have different authors and different uh, you know, thinkers who are saying basically uh, it's not even about multiple intelligences, it's about the fact that we have different cognitive roles at different time in learning in the same class the same person will have different uh, executive functioning happening at different times. So therefore, our teaching needs to be flexible and diverse because people's brains are flexible and diverse, right? So this is gaining traction. Um, when you look at UDL and the work that CAST is doing, it's pretty much based on this, this notion that really it's about meeting this neurocognitive diversity in each one of us, not even across the, the population, but in each one of us there's this inherent uh, neurocognitive uh, diversity. You've also got Todd Rose, who's very popular at the moment, he doesn't work in UDL, but if you, he's got a great TED talk called um, The Myth of the Average. He's got a book now that's come out. Uh, if you go through that, that's what he talks about. He's saying really that each of us needs that flexibility in cognitive uh, functioning, and that lesson should reflect that and provide that as a matter of fact. Again, that's very different because when you look at Todd Rose, he doesn't talk about disability. He yeah, doesn't talk about special groups. He just says, really, the general population, we all need this diversity. Okay. Social capital argument. Show of hand, who's familiar with social capital theory and social capital? Yeah? Okay, not that many. And yet, it's really important because if you look certainly at, uh, you know, at what we've done with inclusion in elementary and secondary uh, classrooms, it's social capital that's the main argument. Social capital argues that when we send kids to school or we send them to a learning uh, environment, it's not the knowledge that's important. It's the connections that they actually create within that environment, right? It's been quite revolutionary. If you look at social services, people have talked about this for decades. It's not something new. Education is only starting to acknowledge that and say, oh, maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe there's some of that happening in school. Of course there's this happening in school. Why do you think people pay incredible fees to send their kids to private school? It's not that the, the, you know, that the teaching that's happening there is any better than elsewhere. It's because of the connections that they make. It's because we realize that these connections actually enable you to do things later on in life. You create net networks. And if you're interested, look at social, uh, social capital theory. It really describes in great depth how the size of these networks, the richness of these networks, the complexity of these networks will give you access to capital. It will give you access to actual opportunities, to jobs, to opportunities to start a business, to things that you'll do in later life. That is why most of what's happened, certainly in the uh, elementary and secondary sector, is based on social capital. Why we've decided to actually push for inclusion is because we've realized that if we segregate students, we actually deprive them of the opportunity to develop their social capital. It's extremely important because if you look at most of what we've done in social work, it's based on the same principle. Why did we uh, move away from institutionalized mental health care into community-based mental health care? It's for the same reason. It's because we've realized if we segregate people, we actually prevent them from gaining this social capital, which is a huge, huge and important thing to have in life. Now, do we do this in higher ed? Take a minute to think. Are we actually thinking about developing social capital in our students? When I send, when I have a classroom of 75 and I send 15 students to an accessibility office to sit an exam, am I developing their social capital? When I ask people to go to a separate parallel system to do things, am I developing social capital? No, that's only going to happen if there's actually a rich interaction within, within the classroom happening where these students are integral part and they're not asked to leave and they're not asked to go anywhere else, right? And maybe that's the, the, the toughest point in higher ed is that we don't do that. And it's strange because most of the, most of the efforts, most of the policy decisions in the, in the West, whether in Canada, UK, uh, the US, has been to develop social capital. And yet in higher ed, our approaches to inclusion do not favor the development of social capital. So we've got a real problem there. Two more, but I'm going to go through this uh, fairly quickly because we don't actually use this much. Uh, but they're also strong arguments. So pedagogical argument. A lot of uh, a lot of people uh, have come around to saying, well, actually, inclusion isn't just about for the students; it's also for the teachers. Um, there's been great longitudinal studies done in Virginia 
uh, just before inclusion policies started around the, the 70s and the 80s, longitudinal comparative studies, which showed not only that uh, inclusive education was beneficial to learners uh, because of social capital gain, but also it was positive and beneficial to teachers because they became, they became better teachers because they had complex and diversified classrooms in front of them. There's also been studies that have shown that if you do the opposite, you have teachers working in selective schools, uh, you know, exclusive schools, competitive schools with a very homogeneous level of, of students, their teaching skills drop. And think about it, it's normal. If you can repetitively do the same thing every week and you don't have to think and you don't have to be creative, how could your teaching improve, right? It's being confronted with that challenge of diversity and addressing diversity that actually makes you a better teacher. Strong argument, right? It's not a big seller in higher ed. <laughs> I haven't seen a you know, faculty sort of embrace that one and say, I really want to do that because I'll become a better teacher. But we need to work on that one too. And then you have the operational argument, which is really about money, about saying actually parallel systems, segregated systems, they don't work, they're super expensive. This is a big argument because if you look at governments around the world, this is why we're moving towards mainstreaming. It's not because necessarily they always believe in inclusion, but they know that it's now too costly and we actually need to do this in an inclusive way. We need to put people in the same place. They're not quite sure how it's going to happen there, but they say this is where it needs to happen because in terms of budget, this is the only cost-effect sustainable way for it to happen. This has become more important now in higher ed. And certainly as an accessibility uh, director, I've had some traction when you walk into senior administration and you show them figures and you say, this is how much it's gonna cost in 10 years time if we don't change things. Everyone goes, oh no, we can't afford that, right? So that argument is starting to, to have more pull. Again, it only works if what we're providing as a replacement is actually inclusion, right? Not if it's something half-baked that's not inclusion yet. It's the only way we're gonna save money is if we do it well. We put people together and we redesign delivery and we redesign assessment. So, you know, with UDL it would work. Just putting people together and saying we don't need accessibility offices anymore will not work, that's obvious. Um, so, we have basically very different formats, right? When we start to think about what does it look like, we didn't agree. We have very different intention, we're on that road, but we all look like uh, you know, those four characters from the Wizard of Oz. We actually are probably heading for very different di directions. We don't have the same, uh, the same intention. Really, you can call it theoretical stance. You don't actually seek the same thing when you're trying to look for inclusion. I want to come to the third part of, let me check the time. I'll try and wrap this up on time. Uh, to come to the third part of the, of the presentation, I also wanted to look at who are, who are the stakeholders, right? So this is a, the third opportunity you'll have to discuss uh, this together. So inclusion is not just about impairment, not just about disability. And what's great is this morning, I've been to a couple of sessions where this was brought up already. So I want to take a few minutes to think of, try and, and think of all the different groups on your own campus and your own institutions, the different group of stakeholders that are all also involved in inclusion, that are also uh, involved in this journey that we're taking together. Uh, students with disabilities, which other students? Which other students on the campus also would like to see inclusion uh, implemented? Okay, so take a few minutes and try and see if you can, what list you come up with. How are we doing? Should be able to do. Yeah, yeah. So at about quarter past four, the Q and A. You said you wanted yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It should work.
I'll give them one more minute or more. Okay. We nail it there. I've been told we've got 10 minutes to go and then questions and then you have lunch. So we have to, to keep moving. Obviously, you could talk for a long time. It's a long list, right? I'm not going to pass the microphone because it wasn't successful last time. You're all being shy. So I'll put up a slide and we can discuss. But obviously, gender, race, ethnicity, indigenous students for us in North America. But in Europe, you have problem with, you know, the problem of Roma students, and it's something very, very similar as well, and, and there's huge work around the European Union about integration of Roma students. First generation undergraduates. Poverty versus privilege. International students and second language learners. I put gender again, but sexual orientation, different, okay? There's others, right? Even after I'd send a slide. Um, returning servicemen, right? It's starting to be a problem everywhere. In Canada, in England, maybe less than in the US. But if you look at the literature in the US, it's a huge issue in higher education, right? People who come back with the GI Bill, they come back from combat, they go straight into university, and they fail. Retention is terrible because they're really suffering from PTSD, they can't find their feet, and it's a huge, huge problem. It's a huge problem in North America. The students as well, right? It's part of inclusion. We should actually be looking at their needs and how to design things in a way that actually suits them. Um, Minority, you know, I put second language speakers, but minority speakers. So in Canada, bilingual country, everywhere you go, you are going to find students who are actually in the minority language. We have Belgian colleagues here, same things. Um, and we also need to include them. It's a real concern for them, right? If you're a minority speaker, even within your own country, you're in a campus where the language of instruction is not you know, the language you speak at home. It may, be, it may be one of the two official languages, but you're still a minority and you're still not being, you know, sort of uh, adequately provided for on your campus. Um, some great things that I thought about. Yesterday, I had uh, the opportunity to do something I love doing when I come to Dublin. I walked over to Lighthouse Cinema, and I saw you know, one of the films I was there, and it's the film called Girl. I really encourage you to see it if you haven't seen it, on the experience of trans students, uh, trans teens. It's a remarkable movie, extremely touching. And it's about you know, this trans, trans uh, youth who's con you know, in the process of conversion at 16, and it hits you home that these are students who are then going on to higher ed, and what are we doing to actually accommodate them? All right. In terms of uh, the, the GIs and uh, returning servicemen, there's another book I've noted down. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to read it, Sparta. It's by Roxana Robinson. It's a book I read a few months ago about you know, an American soldier coming back to a city and trying to go to college and trying to, you know, to readapt despite PTSD and things like this. So all of these diverse groups, we should be addressing them in our discourse. But are we actually doing that? Especially us, as accessibility specialists, actually, are we actually addressing the needs of these students? Now, what's great is this morning, there were already conversations, uh, especially about uh, from the Montfort, where people started talking about intersectionality. The fact that actually, yes, people who come to accessibility services are often white rather than, uh, than non-white. The fact that we have uh, more female students that come towards uh, the services than, than males. All sorts of disparities that we know and we're not really addressing. What's intersectionality? So it has two meanings. The first one being that students can be feeling oppression 
from different uh, sort of uh, different dimensions of their of their existence and their lived experience. So they may have a disability, but they may also be of color, or they may uh, be a woman, or they may be uh, you know gay, LGBTQ, or they may uh, be trans. All sorts of different dimensions that overlap and actually make that experience so much more complicated. Um, so we have to think about how do we integrate the students and how do we think about, um, I thought about talking about the user experience because for, that, for those students, it's not a fragmented experience. They're actually living that experience in one go. Then we as service users are trying to fragment this and say, go to the accessibility service for that part of your experience. Go to the welfare office for that part of your experience. Go to this other office for that part of your experience. And we need to blend our discourses because if we as accessibility services are talking about inclusion but we don't talk about it in a way that enables these groups to actually identify with what we do, then we're segregating as well. So next slide, I'm gonna encourage you to self-reflect as we close off and think about this as I read the, uh, the, the slide to, to do a little bit of self-reflection. How do we break out of these silos and create successful interdisciplinary collaborative practices that span the whole of the spectrum of diversity? How can each of you start having a discourse that enables all of these groups to actually come towards you to, to work in the same, towards the same direction? How do we engage with colleagues who say, serve other populations, right? We become masters in higher education of creating silo structures where often even within student services, we don't talk to the person in the other service. We don't collaborate with them. We don't have the same background, the same training, and we don't cross over and we don't collaborate interdisciplinarily. How do we begin the task of creating a common language and shared practice around, around inclusion? It's not easy, is it? So I could give you some more time to interact together on this, but we've got lunch coming, so I'm just gonna move, move along. But I did want to, so to, to bring up some solutions so we don't feel like we're completely um, sort of stuck in this. These are only some solutions, the ones I can think of. There's probably a lot more within the room that you know, are coming to mind as we're reflecting about this. Extend your efforts to other colleagues and services beyond disability. And this is really important. I think each of you can do that at the, the scale of your professional uh, practice. Um, I know when I worked, for example, in McGill as uh, Director of Accessibility, right from the start, we started working with First People's House, which is the service that provides services to uh, indigenous students on campus. And right away, we saw that there was a great need for that because indeed, there were lots of students who were indigenous and had disability, but they could not deal with this fragmentation of service. So coming together and providing a round table where actually you have the indigenous advisor and you have the accessibility advisor at the same table doing the same intake at the same time using a common vocabulary, that made all the difference, right? In feedback and in outreach in a number of students that are actually coming forward and requesting services. The next one, develop a momentum on your campus that capitalizes on this overlap. And that's the second meaning of intersection, right? Intersectionality can be the fact that the same person is, is feeling oppressions on different parts, different identities that they have. But intersectionality is also different groups coming together because they have a shared sense of oppression. There's a great um, overlap between the experiences of a student with disability a second language learner who's international who's coming into the classroom, a first generation student, an, you know, uh, an indigenous student, they are, you talk to them and you will see they actually have the same problem. They are encountering barriers in the way we teach them. They find that teaching has not been designed for their needs. We teach in a sort of ready-made way and that has never really thought about their user experience in terms of actually adapting their teaching to them. And that's true for all of these, for these groups. So if they came together, imagine what different momentum we could have on our campuses. Create a scholarship that is interdisciplinary. And that's really important, and I really encourage you to do that. And I know sometimes it's frustrating, you think, but this is not what I do. I work in accessibility, I work in inclusion, and today, tonight there's a book launch, and you will see that I wrote a book about using UDL with international students. Why? Because I was seeing that there was a need for this, and there was a need for me to actually go into this, this, this other field and this other group of, of practitioners to actually talk to them and invite them to use the same vocabulary, invite them to use UDL so we could actually have a common discourse between these different groups. And I'm sure all of you, when you thought about this, which are the colleagues you could do that? Which are the other sort of units within your campuses that you could do that and maybe work on collaborative writing, collaborative research, working together sort of halfway? Um, 
Next one, ensure your formulation of UDL invites colleagues serving other populations towards the model. Often that's just a little tweaking of what you do. Go through your material, go see how you define UDL, how you are selling it to your campus, and try and reframe this in a different way. I'll give you an example. Because of the multiple sort of professional experience that I had, when I arrived at McGill and I started working as director of the accessibility service, uh, I was asked by my director, head of student services, she said, you need to, we're doing this strategic exercise, you need to redefine the mandate of your office. And everyone's like panicked, oh my God, what are we gonna do? This is probably gonna take months. And I said, okay, to facilitate and support the inclusion of diverse learners. And we were done. And everyone was happy with that, right? So sometimes, you know, it didn't talk about disability, but it included disability. It opened the door for other people to also feel that this service was for them. Sometimes it's as simple as that, but to reframe your wording so that you invite those colleagues in, you invite these other stakeholders, rather than stick to a vocabulary that doesn't, and a framing that doesn't allow that. One that I added last night when I was thinking about this is also cross-hiring. Um, and I'm seeing this a lot in, uh, in Canada, which is really uh, sort of encouraging. People are starting to say, okay, we're gonna hire someone from another unit to come and work within disability, or we're gonna hire someone from disability to work in another student services. And that's creating a nice sort of osmosis. The other thing that we're seeing is an exporting of our, of our expertise. And maybe that exporting needs to be even voluntary and proactive. Um, several Canadian colleagues that I can cite, we have Ruth Fraser who is in the room as a Canadian colleague, people who worked in disability but then have become uh, involved in student services generally and then have taken that expertise and moved it on to the whole of student services within their campus. Uh, Meg Orton as well, who is a colleague that I've worked with in Canada and written stuff with, uh, used to work in disability and then has become head of student services and, and so has been able to take that expertise and actually use that dialogue to, to in, a, in a whole sort of uh, student services and student affairs uh, context. There's also Cathy Kaplan who works at OCAD in, Tor in Toronto. She was here last year and she used to work in an accessibility office and now works in diversity and equity office and she's able to do wider work with all of these different groups that we've cited, uh, exporting that knowledge of UDL, exporting that into the wider context for all of these learners, all these stakeholders. Um, let's see, time. two minutes, okay. Uh, I just gonna, I'm gonna finish with this anecdote. This is just an anecdote from Canadian context. And you will see very quickly what I'm getting at with this. So on a typical Canadian college, campus, college or, or university, it's the same, about 10% of students uh, register as having a disability. 25% of students on most Canadian campuses are international students or second language learners. 5% normally as a rule identifies being indigenous. 33%, this is from University Affairs official st uh, stats, identifies being first generation undergraduate. Well, you total all this up and it's 73% of our campus students. That is not a minority discourse. Think of the traction we can get if you can present to your senior administration and when you talk about inclusion, when we talk about UDL, we actually are trying to serve the needs of 73% of our campus population. Okay? So I'll leave it on that. I think it's a powerful thought and then we'll take questions and then we'll go off to, to lunch.